Hello, and a huge welcome to Birmingham City University. Now, I've had the privilege of being Chancellor of this great institution since 2016, and I'd like to extend a very personal Midlands greeting to you all. Hello. Now, I know I grew up a bit west of here in Dudley, uh, but Birmingham has always been a major part of my life. I auditioned for a talent show called New Faces in Birmingham, and it transformed my life completely. And so to be here at Charles Parker Day, celebrating one of BBC Birmingham's and radio's greatest artists is a special pleasure. Charles worked out of Pebble Mill here, but his work celebrated in words and song, ordinary working men and women from all over the country. At a time 60 years ago, when people all wore suits and ties, even the women, and spoke real BBC English, the voices Charles brought to the microphone were sharp, fresh and different. Radio has, over the past 15 years, been a big part of my life. I've made loads of documentaries and done some fantastically imaginative radio plays, and I just love the way you can paint pictures in sound. One of my heroes has always been the wonderful African-American playwright, August Wilson. It all came together a few years ago when I got to act in one of Wilson's most famous plays, Fences. Then, a few months later, I found myself in Pittsburgh, where August Wilson grew up and did his greatest work, making a radio documentary all about him. How good was that? I got to meet and record August Wilson's actual family and colleagues. <laughs> the magic of making a documentary about one of my heroes was like winning the lottery. I've always had this fascination with words, and my mother taught me how to read when I was four. And it was something about the idea that there were these symbols and that you could actually tell someone what you were thinking by using them. And I think from that moment, I was gone. This is kind of working class life in Pittsburgh. You know, I'm from a working class background, but this is very, very poverty stricken. This was people living cheek by jowl and refusing to melt into a nice convenient melting pot. The two rooms, there was no heat, but one was the kitchen and there was a stove, so the stove would serve. So, congratulations to all those of you who've been nominated for the award this year. Congratulations! And to everybody here, have a fabulous Charles Parker Day at Birmingham City University, Boston. <laughs> Big thank you there to man who needs no introduction, uh, Lenny Henry, brilliant stuff. Um, so yeah, welcome to the Charles Parker Day, uh, the annual celebration of the audio and radio feature, past, present and future. Um, it's great to be returning to an in-person event um, for reasons we all know. We haven't been able to do this for the past couple of years. And um, as you can see, those of you here in the room, um, places have been restricted this year. So uh, today's event is also available via a live stream on the Charles Parker Trust YouTube channel. So a very warm welcome to everyone from the various universities that are here today, both here in person and watching online. Uh, my name's Kelly Weil. I'll be just guiding you through the events this afternoon. Um, I've been a radio producer for 20 years, as well as a part-time folk singer. So the work, the groundbreaking work that Charles Parker did with the radio ballads have been a huge inspiration to me on many levels. And I was lucky enough to be part of the production team that revived the ballads format for Radio 2 on a number of occasions in 2006 and 2012. So it's a, a huge uh, privilege to be here. And uh, we're going to begin today's events by asking the chair of the judging panel of the Charles Parker Prize, uh, Simon Elms, to come to the stage. Simon's been the chair of the panel since uh, the inaugural year, since it started in 2005, and he's going to tell you about this year's nominees. So welcome, Simon. Hey, thank you. Well, welcome to Charles Parker Day in-person event and to everybody watching at home. What a wonderful thing. I, back in December, uh, when we were talking about whether we should stage it or whether we should go um, online again, I was very, very keen that we uh, do try and do an in-person event because I think that there's something really magical about being able to be in a room with a lot of people. So, you know, that is a fantastic achievement. So thank you so much for being here and respecting all the, the rules that uh, we've laid down. But anyway, to this year's competition, what 
a marvellous year it's been. It's about the only thing you can say about this year that has been marvellous, but it was, as far as the Charles Parker competition is concerned, it's been fabulous. We had a, a pretty much record number of entries back up from a slight dip last year, understandably. We had 42 entries, and that was 42 nearly 15-minute programmes. That's a lot of listening for the judges. Um, but the quality was fantastically high. And uh, we also had a wider range of universities and colleges and institutions, tertiary institutions joining us here. So a big welcome for uh, Leeds Trinity University and for UCL in London, who've joined the merry band of Charles Parker entrants. We're very pleased to see them. And uh, they have also joined the shortlistees as well. Um, first of all, we couldn't have done this huge effort of listening without a fabulous set of judges this year. I mean, it's, they're always wonderful, but a big thank you to, as always, Philip Sellers, who's our stalwart from the BBC, executive editor at BBC Radio Documentaries Unit, and my old colleague and boss, um, to Stephanie Billen, who does the Observer Radio Previews, and Stephanie's been a judge before, and she did a sterling turn again. Newcomers were Monica Whitlock and Alia Kassam, uh, two great producers who were really delightful members of the team and who really contributed hugely. And to my old friend Tony Phillips, who having been uh, commissioning editor of Radio 4, went to work in New York and is now back in this country running uh, a podcast, uh, uh, documentary podcast uh, concern. So they were fantastic judges, and as always, there were wrangles and fights and agreements and disagreements, but we did actually have an amazing degree of unanimity, which I was immensely uh, relieved about. Um, we also have Richard Knight, who is commissioning editor for Specialist Factual at the BBC, who again will be commissioning five of the uh, Charles Parker entries from this year for the new Storytellers Strand in uh, July. And uh, you're not going to hear about them until the end of the afternoon. So I'm afraid you're going to sit on the edge of those very comfortable seats for a few hours to know which five that he has chosen from the 11 shortlistees uh, that we had this year, 11 of them, um, and who won the big gold. Anyway, let's get on with these 11 wonderful shortlistees. So... A lot of the programmes this year were, frankly, about doom and gloom. I'm not surprised. As I said at the beginning, I don't think it's been the most wonderful of year in all sorts of ways, and it's going forward into a really grim future. But um, let's put that aside. There was an awful lot of um, concern with problems, programmes about problems. We had attention deficit disorder twice. We had psychosis, we had sexual orientation worries, we had conversion therapy, very topical. We had loneliness, disease, mutilation, one about a man who'd lost, a motorbike rider who'd lost his leg, and naturally enough, sadly, about death. And that, mm, shall we say, slightly dark theme was reflected in our shortlist. Now, obviously, we can't play 11 clips individually. It would take us probably till everybody's tummies have stopped rumbling for dinner. Um, but So what I've done is to group them in four groups of two or three programmes. And I've, you can't read anything from the way I've grouped them. I've tried to spread the, keep the subjects themed and spread the love of the universities that are contributing them around a bit. So there is nothing, nothing that you can infer about who are the five lucky winners and the gold winner from what I'm going to present to you. So with COVID very much on everybody's mind, um, two of our uh, shortlistees took COVID as a theme in some way or other. Ella Bicknell from Leeds Trinity University had the brilliant idea of reaching out to people during the pandemic. She wrote warm letters of friendship to people she'd never, ever met, selected randomly by 
postcode in a post random postcode generator. That was a program called Letters from a Stranger. And the judges said it was a lovely idea, nicely contained and simple in approach. Star of this piece was the random recipient of the letters, Pedro, a beautiful, thoughtful, reflective voice. The program was a little gem about kindness and connection. Then we have a program called Breathing Lyrical by Takwa Sadiq of University College London, which dealt with long COVID from which she was suffering. The author found herself devoid of energy having uh, succumbed to COVID and at a loss for a pathway to recovery, turned to the power of an ancient Persian poem to help her breathe. A very unusual, interesting take on a now common, sadly common pro program, said the judges. The journey of the program was beautiful, a real feature, a fantastically interesting idea, well made. Music and effects are used with great good taste, an excellent program. Finally, in this first trio, a mystery box locked and discovered in a dusty attic has lies at the heart, the very heart, of in, inimitably named Black Box by Charlie Billingham of Goldsmiths, University of London. What lies within and what does it, the, what does it reveal about the subject's father, who was an unassuming Mr. Chips-like former Latin teacher? This started so strongly, judges agreed, exciting, elegant, with good music and effects. It was very well structured, a good tale. So what did the box contain? Inside it had, well, just wait and see. Um, when I opened it, the first thing I saw was a letter from to Marion, Marion Wood, who was uh, my great aunt, the sister of my grandmother, Evelyn. As well as that, there was a picture of a, somebody who I thought initially was uh, Pa, with blonde hair in a uh, military service uniform, but it wasn't Pa, I recognise it wasn't Pa. And then there was also a metal tube, a documents tube, and also a, 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 an envelope separately marked private and confidential information for anyone investigating the family tree. I embarked on this project hoping to make an impact on him. Never could I have known the impact it would have on me. 15th of April 2020 from Bradford. Dear Ella, many thanks for your mysterious letter. When it arrived on my doorstep, I was indeed shocked. Not every day you get a letter from a stranger. It took some time to sink in, but with everything terrible that's been happening with the coronavirus outbreak, I feel like an angel from up above has come to say hello to me. My name is Pedro. I was born in a place called Tenya, which is in Goa. I admire you for taking both the initiative and bravery to write to a complete stranger. And for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I've been reciting poetry for a few weeks, and today I realised something remarkable. I've actually extended how long I can hold my breath. I'm nowhere near completely cured, but I'm excited about where this could get me in six months or a year even. 900 years ago, Saadi expressed exactly what I'm hopeful for when he wrote, nadoram. <laughs> Grief for the present or distress for the past does not trouble me. I draw my breath in comfort and thus spend my life. I think we'll all be, all be adopting Persian poetry. It's so beautiful. Um, moving on, a couple of, of, of programs now that deal with longer-term issues, issues that can blight 
whole lifetimes. The affliction that Christina Hardinge of UCL charts in a personal, uh, is, is personal only in as much as it's the condition alcoholism of another person that has affected the subject's life. That person is the subject's mother and her addiction, Christina says, has taken on an actual persona whom she calls Alec or Alec Anonymous, the title of her programme. The judges said, this is a very tough listen that almost brought tears to my eyes. The programme has a real creative spark as well as being very authentic and emotional with a speaker both articulate and vulnerable. It flowed so well I barely noticed the structure. In Living with HIV, Kate White of the University of the West of England chronicled the lives of a number of people for whom, despite the availability of modern and uh, life-preserving treatments, still face a life of uncertainty and, above all, prejudice. This is a proper documentary, said the judges. A good idea, despite the familiarity of the topic, these subjects are less well covered, including straight, white and black women who are still finding prejudice and life-changing shock following a positive HIV diagnosis. Accomplished, confident and fascinating, an important story with strong interviews. Great to start, they said, with a middle-aged woman. How did you feel when you received your diagnosis? Wow. Huh. Um, shocked, to say the least. Yeah, shocked, surreal, very, very strange. I didn't know anyone else at that time that was HIV positive. No anger, no tears, I think fear more than anything. I was married, I had two children. My husband had been incredibly ill for probably 18 months, two years, and was diagnosed himself with days to live really, but on a neurology ward because there's so many misdiagnoses it was really hard to spot, you know, I guess they just assumed it was a straight married man. Um, why would you look for that? You know, when you put two and two together and you look at the symptoms that you're having yourself that I'd previously just put down to stress, I was actually really ill. I was actually really ill. I would take the tube home on my own from primary school. And right next to the tube station, there was a little corner shop and the guy in there I got to know very well because I would, without fail, stop in there to get myself a packet of fruit gums. I would walk up the hill to my parents' house and I remember putting so many in my mouth, my jaw was aching, feeling a little pain in my throat but not caring because there would be the next handful that would go in. The sweetness and the sugar and that immediate hit of happiness. That was the thing that was going to prepare me to be able to go in and deal with whatever was happening at home. I just remember always walking into the house very quiet with the door. I would hold my breath so that I could really tune into the house. Was there a smell in the house? Was a lot of perfume there? That would be an indicator. Was there a Sprite bottle somewhere? Alec would always carry a Sprite bottle around with him. If he was there and they were awake, then it was about trying to have as short a conversation as possible to placate whatever they wanted, but also just playing along with the fact that I was going to pretend that I couldn't see Alec was there at all when obviously it's so, so obvious that he's there. And then I'd try and get out of the room. Another mother now, but again, a tale of sadness and pain. The Sound Collector features two sisters whose mother died in, uh, died, uh, in, in an accident when they, were, when they were children. Together, the sisters recollect their mum as they leaf through an old exercise book in which one of them, as a tiny child, had written a poem and three simple telling words my mummy died the judges said of talia augustidis 
feature for UCL. It's a moving and original tale, such a layered piece, intelligent, probing, sensitive, a piece to make us think and feel. Gabriel Abramoff's report, Finding a Voice, again for UCL in London, featured a group of women to whom this feature gave a voice and articulacy. There are women living in London for whom English is not their first language, but who've acquired language skills and agency thanks to a local programme of teaching and empowerment. Now, though, funding has been withdrawn and the project has closed. It's a heartfelt piece, said the judges, with moving voices, great stories and exceptional music. The programme took us into a whole other world with a brilliantly simple and memorable opening scene. It's a worthy subject and a brave piece of advocacy. Finally, in this group of three, articulacy of a very different sort was at the heart of Jaden Steele's searing programme from the University of Sunderland starting to forget, focusing on a devoted elderly Scottish couple. The problem is that the husband, tenderly looked after by his wife, suffers from the dreadful affliction of dementia, though he refuses to believe his diagnosis. Heartbreaking, said the judges, as the grandfather repeats throughout, I don't think I've got this dementia. The couple's relationship is delightful and they reveal themselves as a loving and remarkable pair broken across this horrible affliction. The program is honest, personal and really well put together. You're um, getting more frustrated that you can't do even the things you could do. I used to help you a bit, but now um, you need a little bit more help and um, it puts you frustrates you. I would leave a note if I'm going somewhere or, or doing, you know, I'd, I'd leave you a note because you do, you know. Well, I get worried right he enough. might, He might even forget to look at the note though. I couldn't have got on without her, to be quite honest. But uh, I feel, honestly, I do certainly feel that I've not got this dementia. I, I mean, this, this centre is not just um, for for us it's not there is a lot of meaning i think it's not just learning english it's our family me personally when i when i uh, come every day here i just come to my second house because i know everybody here almost everybody and i uh, i feel like i'm uh, in my home honestly when the when i'm listening that uh, this center is closing um, my, my heart, heart is, is broken. broken. Then where he start again English? Center is, is make my future. Mm. This is my, I think this is my second family. I can't live. I don't like live than my family. I feel disappointed uh, when I heard the the bad news about the city gateway close. And what will I do after closing, uh, we, where will I go uh, after closing? But then there was her poem. This is actually what I want to show you. This is a, it's a poem you wrote in March of 04. And I just thought it was quite, first of all, profound, but also just read it again. Okay. A stranger called this morning dressed in yellow and blue put every sound into a bag and carried them away. The crying of the baby, the swishing of the trees, the turning of key, the blowing, oh, the turning of key, the blowing on the curtains. 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 A stranger called this morning. He didn't leave his name, left us only silence. Life will never be the same. I don't know, that made me think of Mummy. I found that very, very moving. Um, finally, in this glittering collection of features as, who we shortlisted for the 2022 Charles Parker Award for radio, student radio feature, three stories of personal 
tragedy. All are told with visceral knowledge by those who experienced it firsthand. Like the memories of a retired police officer who recalled the stresses of life on the force, having to deal daily with bereaved relatives, violence, and hor horrific scenes of accidents. Guy Gardner's program, called He Wears a Mask and His Face Grows to Fit It, interleaved the officer's memories with an upbeat period recruitment film for the police. The mix is powerful, the judges said. It was interesting to hear this perspective in a beautiful interview. The stories the policemen told were very vivid and the programme was a powerful listen, a bit gruesome, but not in a bad way. Sarah's Spirit by Anna Budd for Goldsmiths told the story of a young Australian au pair who lost her life in the terrible London Bridge terror attack of 2017, five years ago, through the poignant recollections of her mother and her stepfather. According to the judges, this was a very accomplished professional piece, gripping, harrowing, and emotionally immersive. It didn't sugarcoat the impact of the tragedy and had an admirably downbeat ending. Very professional, they concluded. And so to the last of our 11 shortlistees, which deals with a subject very rarely spoken of, at least outside the confines of farming today. It's the stress-filled life of Britain's small farmers, up, at, up before dawn, not in bed often till the small hours. The multiple pressures of livestock and their problems, spiralling costs and bad weather can conspire to drive farmers to the very edge and over the edge into suicide. As we heard in Megan Hayward's Down on the Farm, ironically titled, for the University of Sunderland. She counterpointed the narrative with a lyrical evocation by Owen Shears in a poem of the countryside. The judges liked the impressive storytelling, frank and raw and honest. It included lovely uses of song and was very well recorded and professional. The poem, another judge observed, is beautiful and well delivered. Where we lost ourselves in the hours before dark, year on year until that day, when life put on the brakes and pitched you without notice through the windscreen of your youth. Your father found at dawn a poppy sown in the unripe corn. It was just before Christmas. Jeff, one of my dad's best friends, so I'd known him all my life. Um, very outgoing guy very often in the village pub, you know, always talking to people. Um, and a week before Christmas, um, he, he, he hung himself in, in his, at the farm and his son, his son, who's the same age as me, he found him. Listen to the trees, they're blowing in the breeze. Listen to the then we finally got to see her view her body. And it was definitely Sarah. Sarah's body being in the morgue was cold. Um, yeah, it's definitely her. You know it's her. You can see all her physical features. I've checked all her fingers and toes, her freckles, her earrings. I know every, her birthmarks. I know every, every spot on her body. And I told her how proud I was of her and how much I loved her, and I held her hand. Every police officer's got some things which stick in their mind, which you still dream about. You still wake up and you see them. For instance, how to recognize a lost child. It was a late turn down near the Western Docks in Dover. I had a call, I was on patrol, and I had a call that there was a missing child, a missing four-year-old from some flats down there. And I wasn't the only one down there, but I, I went down there and I, I looked and the child had been playing in this play area. But when we looked at the play area, the fence was broken in one corner. He went down to the railway line, 
and there was a body. I don't know quite why, why we should be applauding the de de discovery of a child's body, but anyway, I, we're applauding actually all 11 shortlistees for this year's Charles Parker Award. Thank you to everybody who entered. Thank you especially to the, tw to the 11 shortlisted programs and to their makers. Wait till this afternoon, at the end of the afternoon, to find out who won. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, and uh, do we, we have some of you here who are nominated that. So would you like to stand up and we can give you a proper cheer and a round of applause? Anyone that's in the building, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, amazing work. And also you can um, see uh, a video of Sarah Parker chatting to all of the nominees on uh, the YouTube channel or at cpatrust.org.uk. Uh, so check that out as well. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next session. At the last in-person event, which was in 2019, we heard about a contemporary twist on the radio ballad format called the Ballad of the Blade. And the team behind that show and two subsequent programmes that they've made since are here today. We've got producer Monica Whitlock and the sound designer John Nichols. Um, so please welcome to the stage Monica Whitlock and John Nichols. Take a seat. Um, while they're getting sorted out with the mic, uh, Monica and John are happy to take questions from the floor as well. So you might want to ask about their approach or production technique or even a technical question or a question about sound design. Uh, now is your chance. So if you want to stick your hand up if you want to ask, ask a question and we'll try and get through as many of those as we can. Right, do we have sound? I think we do. We do, do. amazing. Do. Yeah, right. please do. If you have any questions, do we thought because time's quite short. It would be good to ask things as we go along. Um, so, yeah. and I know you have some clips to play for everyone as well in a little while. But do you want to just tell us a little bit first about the the ballad of the blade and the the kind of twist on that ballad format that you, that sure. you made? Sure. Well, there are three um, half-hour programmes, and they're about um, social issues, but they're made in really quite a simple way, which is. Uh, recording people and really listening and learning from them. Um, they're anonymous, the contributors. Uh, there's no presenter. And then we commissioned a poem to work with the voices. And the poem's written um, from the point of view of an, an object or an item rather than a, a person. So it's, it's not a narration, it's a, it's a perspective. And the poem can jump and shift around and show you different things that uh, you might not have thought of. And then John's music makes it into a whole program. Um, and then we have natural sound, but it's, um, it comes and goes and it illustrates different things. It's not always direct or expected. Um, so it's really a simple formula and there was no very strong recipe or prescription for how it should be, I'd say. Yeah. So we wanted to play the intros to each one. They're the Ballad of the Blade, the, which is about knife crime, the, the Fix, which is about drugs, and the third one is most recent, and it's about uh, betting. Great. Um, so, so should we listen to the, sure. the intro? Yeah, can we have um, Blade A, Pete? Thank you, the intro. This poem begins where someone ends, at the precise moment where the angle of your desperation meets the serrated edge of your fear. Blade, grind, point. Each blade is a narrator, forged from Sheffield steel and flame and lit elsewhere. You carry me in your pocket until well, I carry... While we try and resolve this, uh, <laughs> issues with the sound, maybe we could just have a bit of a chat about the Ballad Blade and then hopefully soon we'll be able to hear it after that. So how did you um, decide upon the, 
you know, the blade as the kind of the, the narrative force of your program? Did you have tons of ideas and you just had to chance on one or? Well, it was commissioned as that, really. It was commissioned to, to that, that was really all the brief, was to uh, look at an item and see where you got from there. And I was a bit, um, didn't know what to make of it at first, because I remember um, things from primary school where you had to write an essay from the point of view of the pound in your pocket. And I thought, you know, that could be really awful. But then it did come to life, and we were, um, our poets all the way through were just fantastic and Mumtaza who took on the first one she really um, brought things to it that I, I you know every time I listen back I see something else or I hear something else that she's brought to it I mean she was just fabulous and musically fabulous to work with <clears throat> yeah one of the, the things I found really interesting about having the poets involvement is is is, is that often um, it's their voice themselves that, 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 that provides a sort of jumping off point for, um, uh, you know, whether that's the pace uh, or, or, or the pulse um, or a visual image, um, as opposed to just starting with the, with the actuality and the voices. It's, it's a really interesting sort of parallel perspective. Um. Yeah, we're just going to get a mic to you, gentleman with the cap. <laughs> it was 11 a.m. <laughs> there you go. Sorry, yeah. But, I mean, so, that was quite clear. It was obviously quite like an avant-garde idea, having kind of music, you know, an object telling a story. Um, did you have to kind of think about the commission to get it to no. say it quite an easy part? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it, it, it's probably less typical of the kind of features you'd hear on, on, on daytime radio. Um, but, but the editor, Hugh, Hugh Levinson, was, was great. You know, he really wanted to push the, you know, the sonic experimentation of it. Um, you know, he was really up for that. So it was great. And, and has been the same with, with the two subsequent ones. Um, so has the poetry effectively kind of replaced the song element of the original radio ballad? Is that, is that the function of the poetry? It's very song-like. It has repetitions and it, it picks up on um, other objects which are spoken about and turns them into rhythms and choruses. It's very flexible. Yeah, and, 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 and I think also that, that, that thing in, in the original ballad of, of placing um, people's unmediated voices alongside a very heightened way of speaking, whether that's song or whether that's a poem, there's a really interesting sort of um, uh, energy you get when you put those, those two things together. And the role of the poetry, was that to move the narrative along as well and not just be a kind of thing that worked alongside it? Because that's something that Charles and Ewan and Peggy did, of course, wasn't it? It was to move the story along with it. Sometimes. I mean, the poetry is very much in response to the recorded voices. And there's a lot of poetry in the recorded voices themselves. Yeah. And often phrases that people have said um, are, are picked up by the poet rather than the other way around. Yeah. Does that, uh, We're going to see if we can hear a up? clip now. Great. Fingers crossed. This poem begins where someone ends at the precise moment where the angle of your desperation meets the serrated edge of your fear. Blade, grind, point. Each blade is an orator, forged from Sheffield steel and flame and lit elsewhere. You carry me in your pocket until I carry you further than you ever expected. It just troubles me, innit? Like straight, like the first thing someone wants to do is step, step on their shoes, step, do this, step, Instagram or this, step. The young person that, that are, part, are part of this are not valuing life or they're not able to value life because everybody from my estate has either been attacked, been stabbed, lost a friend, been arrested. There's not one, there's not one person that made it out clean, bro. There's not one person that made it out clean. I was on edge all the time because once you're carrying a knife, you know what I'm saying, you know you're ready for whatever. It begins with the blush of youth, 
the unknown precipice of puberty. You hang from its cliff top like a bat, clad in the black of an Adidas windbreaker. Upside down and disorientated, you have outgrown the summer lanes you grew up in. Their names now lodged in your throat. You carry your postcode like a sentence. A straight jacket disguised as a street you wear with the kind of pride that is as foolish as it is fated. Queen's Crescent, Andover, Brumel, Lozelles. You are not the first to love what does not love you back. You will not be the last. How long since you've heard that? <laughs> Not long. <laughs> yeah. Any reflections on on hearing that just now? I, th um, I mean, I could talk a bit about the, the, the sort of sound treatment. Um, so, so, so a, a huge amount of the sound material in it was was derived from um, uh, metal sounds, just a kitchen knife being dropped. Um, that that, that <clears throat> was then sort of processed and texturized into these very long ambient textures. Um, which is something I'm very interested in generally, the way that you can take a, um, a recognisable sound and then, and then make it into something very uh, abstract, but somehow it still retains the flavour of the original um, sound at some level. Um, so there are these very long, drawn-out sort of metallic textures that sort of ebbed and flowed around, around Montas's voice. Mm. Can we talk about transitions? Yeah, um, there was some, when we just played that clip, it also reminded me that some of the um, street recordings are of things that are not directly connected with crime or anything to do with the programme, really. They were just sounds around where I live. Um, and they're, they're recorded inside McDonald's and in a street market, and they'll, people say things that might or might not make you uneasy, but they're, we they're not really strongly featured, so you could hear them the first time you hear the programme, or you might hear them the second time. But so um, they just blend into John's music, really. What were you going to say about transitions? Um, well, just, just picking up on that, there's an interesting th thing in this piece in particular about um, how in a lot of these young people's lives there, there's a sort of dual reality in, in, in the environment you're walking around in um, because there are these invisible boundaries that to cross which is is very dangerous because you're straying into someone else's um, territory and, and and so the sense that these everyday sounds whether they're in McDonald's or in the shops to one person they look that and sound straightforward and unthreatening but from a different perspective they're very threatening because they mark the um, you know a dangerous sort of boundary that you don't want to step over um, and again I think that was an interesting sort of um, sense throughout it um, yeah it's like there are two geographies playing all the time yeah. through that that piece there's the, the internal geography of how it feels to be one age and then another that might be invisible to another person there's a question now just getting a mic over to Hi, I'm Hannah from Hannah. Radio 4. Hello. Um, I was wondering, it's 28 minutes, which is quite a long time. So how is it structured within that? Is there like a story arc that takes you through the full 28 minutes? Yeah, there's a sort of story arc, but um, we made the decision sort of midway through to not use any names because people felt more comfortable uh, anonymously. And um, it, it, it was quite a liberating thing, really, because you don't have to follow... I mean, a lot of our contributors, I mean, all our contributors had either, you know, been involved in knife crime or had suffered from knife crime or both of those things at different points in their life. And because they were anonymous, we didn't feel you had to point out who had done what. And so the, the story arc that you might normally get in 28 minutes became much more sort of experiential. Like everybody talked about growing up and um, different uh, internal changes they'd made. So it kind of, it seems to 
to build and then it builds towards the light at the end, but it hasn't got a, a sort of conventional structure. I mean, I mean maybe the, 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 the structure is more sort of thematic in that we move through these kind of thematic areas. Um, uh, you know, particularly in the, the, um, something like Ballad of the Bet, um, w which is much more um, historical in the sense it's, it, it looks, you know, we talk to people who, who were growing up in Liverpool in, in, in the sort of 40s and 50s and, and, and were sort of gambling with cash down the docks and then betting shops. Uh, and then we move forward to um, sort of online gambling and gambling on your phone. And then towards the end, uh, we, we go into the uh, sort of gambling in, in virtual reality, which is a whole new thing. So, so it's more that sort of sense of moving through a linked thematic areas, maybe rather than a, a sort of more narrative. Shall we hear Stop. another clip? Sure. Should what we, what, what we, have we got? What, what's <laughs> should we can listen to? Um, she was in the beginning of Ballad of the Bet. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Could, can we have Bet A intro? Thank you. <laughs> or whatever comes. I've got a horse. I've got a horse. I'm free. You don't speak to that many gamblers now, but if you did, they'll only tell you about the winners. They never tell you about the losers. The losers are personal. They're in the heart. There used to be a man that used to stand in the back entry. I always remember him standing with a long mac on and a cap. And he wouldn't say anything. And my dad used to fold the paper around the money and tell me to run up the back entry and give it to the man. And I used to go up and say, that's off me dad, number 11. Here comes the hair. Who am I? I live on the edge of anticipation, where the coastal winds are warmed by the bright lights of the pier arcade. Spin, flash, song, you know me as a flutter. The beat, a whir, coins drumming through machine arteries. I stand at the back, Mac and cap and a scrap of paper. I am the pulse and burn of hope. The door opening. The tension, the anticipation, the waiting, the anxiety, the nervousness, the excitement, the rush, all those things in five to 10 seconds. Actually, the outcome's irrelevant. It's that 20 seconds, as that ball's going around when you're completely, completely transfixed on where this ball is landing. And actually winning, made it worse. Online, it, it, you could get that rush probably 200 times in an hour. That's, that's gambling. <laughs> so how did you find your contributors? What's your approach to finding those everyday stories many of them out there? Well, that's a good question. I mean, no special process. I think just mostly our contributors were people that we came across. Um, that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were no special way. Um, it was very much people who wanted to contribute. And I think people who um, uh, wanted to contribute rather than being chased for it. Yeah. And especially the people who committed crimes. I mean, there was no pressure on them to, to speak on, or, or give a name or to reveal what they'd done. I, didn't, I felt quite early that you're not trying to make somebody say the most awful thing that had ever happened. In fact, the opposite of that. Um, and that was, I think, a reassuring atmosphere that there weren't going to be, you know, oh, here's so-and-so, he's a murderer, or she's a drug addict. You know, it wasn't like that at all. And we were really there to listen and learn. Um, and met some really amazing people. And they loved it being radio, actually. I think none of those interviews would have worked if we'd uh, had been a TV crew. Mm. They're very intimate, and they were all in people's houses or out in the street. There was no studio. Yeah. And what did you learn after the Ballad of the Blade? When you come to make a second one, was your approach the same, or were there things that you did differently after having been through the process once? Um, 
I think from my point of view, what was great with, with the, the second and third one was, was that I was able to get involved a lot earlier um, and uh, have the, the, not only Monica's um, interviews, but also the dr early drafts of the, 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 the poems just to have in my mind. We, we got um, both Neil Campbell, who did the poem for Ballad of the Fix, and Amy Aker, who did Ballad of the Bet. Just, um, when they were just working out drafts, I would just ask them to sit in their kitchens and just record drafts on their phone. Um, and that was really useful because I could just start play, playing their voices against bits of actuality and bits of music. Um, and you can hear with Amy's voice just now that she has such a sort of rhythmic pulse in the way she delivers because she's she basically comes out of a whole live performance like slam poetry basically um, so and there's something about the energy of her delivery that, that that I found really useful getting a handle on what the sort of the pulse and the, the vibe of the music should be um, whereas Neil in in Ballad of the Fix um, was much more sort of laid back, um, and um, but that actually really worked because because that was much more about this the sort of because um, the perspective was was, was yeah because the perspective was was from the perspective of the fix the the, the hit going into that sort of um, uh, you know getting the hit of heroin where everything sort of drifts away that his sort of laid back delivery weirdly worked with that it was the whole and the whole way you put it together was much more sort of fluid and woozy whereas Ballad of the Blade was much more um, uh, you know the transitions are much more abrupt um, yeah there's a dreaminess in the um, maybe we should maybe we should hear something like um, uh, probably has time for one more clip mm. so um, well we can either your go choice either Dave the window cleaner or um, the sirens and waves, but perhaps the sirens and waves is yeah. more what we're talking yeah. about. C could we go for fix C sirens? Thanks, Pete. Children that are getting brought up by grandparents because mum and dad are either both in jail, maybe overdosed, or maybe just not capable of looking after them. The turning blue lights that are moving sea. Family keeps standing there waiting on the shore, calling and waving. And sometimes you'll make it. And making it, feel another tide ready to pull you away. I've been revived at least three times. I've scored drugs from dealers that other people at that time that scored drugs from the same people went off and had a massive overdose. Um, the, the, there's no, there's no anything different for me than, than all the people that. The, um, didn't make it. At the end. Excellent. I think we had one more question. We have a hand up, sorry, I can't locate a mic, so speak loudly. Um, I guess there were quite a big range of people over those three programmes, was, so I can't say that there's a general view, but um, I think the anonymity and the, the um, I think the freshness of the programmes, once we'd had one programme, you could, you could send it to people and say this is the kind of thing, you know, if you're interested in 
talking to us, so that, that, so that it became more, more straightforward. And people were really enthusiastic, actually. Um, there was nothing special about the interviewing. They were just normal conversational interviews that you would make for any program. I don't, nobody felt, I think, that they were being put on the spot. And I didn't ask anything very awkward. It's just, um, you know, holding a mic where people want to go. And I think that that's probably a, a characteristic of all three programs, is um, that it really follows what people say and not what they're being pushed. I mean, I'm not pushing people to say anything. It, they're reflecting, really, on moments in their lives. We'll end the session. Thanks for your questions, by the way. And um, a big hand for uh, Monica and John. Monica Whitlock and John Nichols. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Congratulations on great programmes. And those three programmes are available to listen to if you want to listen to them in full um, as part of the Seriously collection on Radio 4. So you can get them on BBC Sounds, of course. So do check them out. OK, um, on to our next guest. Uh, in the original radio ballads, of course, Peggy Seeger and Ewan McCall, working closely with Charles Parker, of course, um, spent loads and loads and loads of hours recording the voices and stories of ordinary people, which they then later turned into songs. And, um, and Charles developed the ballad as a live format as well. And our next guest is carrying on that great tradition all these years later. He's the main songwriter in the award-winning folk group, The Young'uns. I'm a big fan. And he's here to talk to us about his approach to turning people's stories into songs. So please give a warm welcome to Sean Cooney. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Uh, lovely to be here. Um, hi to everyone watching online as well. Um, one of the last uh, online things we did was a, a streamed, well, a, a Zoom concert for some uh, primary school kids in Cambridge. And um, as the three of us in the group were just kind of standing there in Dave's sitting room waiting for it to, waiting to get the green light, we could hear one of the kids in the class go, Sir, they look poor. <laughs> and then a pause and a teacher's voice, they can hear you. <laughs> uh, so I hope I don't look too shabby. Um, it, it's, it's great to be here. And uh, as Kelly said, I'm, I'm a folk singer, but I'm, I'm sort of an accidental folk singer, really, because when I was a kid, I didn't know what folk songs were. And music in general felt really inaccessible to me. It felt like it was for other people. I couldn't play an instrument, I couldn't sing in tune, I couldn't hold a note, I couldn't, definitely couldn't get in the school choir as much as I wanted to. Um, but one night when I was 17, um, along with Michael and David, who were my band members, we were in a pub, or maybe I should say one night when we were 18, um, we were in a pub in Stockton on Tees, and so the story goes, we, um, we heard strange sounds coming from the back room. So we went in and we found a room full of people singing, singing without instruments, singing in their own accents, singing in our accents, singing about places that we knew, singing about the River Tees, the Cleveland Hills, singing about Stockton and even Hartlepool. We didn't know you could do such a thing. It was a folk club and people had met in the back room of that pub for, for 40 years at that point, every Monday night, sharing these songs. And we wondered why you'd, no one had ever taught us these songs in school, where they came from. And it was such a, you know, a, a life-changing moment uh, f for the three of us. And we kept going back to that, to that club and, and it was so welcoming and, and honest and everyone was encouraged to get up and sing a song, no matter if you had a big voice or a little voice. No matter if you forgot the words halfway through, that was fine because there'd always be someone at the back to shout them out to you. No matter if you were half cut and you had a pint in your hand and you had to stop halfway through the song to give out this enormous belch, no one minded. It was it, it, folk music was for everybody. Um, 
And we were soon to learn that most of the songs we were hearing, the songs that referenced where we came from, Teesside, Stockton, Middlesbrough, North Yorkshire, most of them had been written by one extraordinary individual, uh, a man who, who knew and worked with Charles Parker on the radio ballads, um, Graham Miles. And Graham indeed attended these events in his later years until his death in 2013. And Graham was actually born in Greenwich in 1935 and his family moved up to Teesside uh, when he was a kid. And there's a brilliant story that I'll never tire of telling about Graham. When he was 14, perhaps 15 in 1949, 1950, he heard folk songs on the radio and he knew that the Geordies, 30 miles north, they had loads of songs. And he knew that there were loads of songs about Lancashire. So he went into Middlesbrough Library and he asked the librarian where he could find the books of Teesside songs. And the librarian said, oh, we haven't got any. And I don't think he made the decision right then and there, but he thought, well, why? Why are there no songs about this, this, this thriving community, this, this industrial heartland with, with beautiful landscape and heritage and uh, beauty all around it. And Graham kind of would later take the decision that if no one was going to write these folk songs about where he came from, then it had to be him. And so a few years later, he was working in the Dorman Museum in Middlesbrough and he decided that that was it. He handed in his re resignation and he sort of took to the road to experience everything that he wanted to write about. So for a year he worked in an iron foundry just so he could live it and breathe it and write songs authentically about it. He worked in a quarry, he worked on the River Tees and his legacy is well over 200 songs that have travelled around the world and many people sing these songs in Australia and New Zealand and, and they introduce them as traditional songs, songs that they believe are hundreds of years old, not knowing that they were written by this one person in Middlesbrough in the 1960s and 70s. And that, I think, is exactly what he would have wanted. Um, we were very fortunate as, as a band, the Young'uns, to, um, to, to make a, a, a programme for the My Muse series on Radio 4 in 2017, um, discovering uh, Graham. Uh, so we're going to play a, a clip now, Pete, please, from that programme. We were constantly under the impression as kids that we came from an ugly area, a deprived area, and an unromantic area. We had no idea that a few decades before we were born, there was a man who wrote about this area and did so with the most incredible lyricism and beauty. And hearing these words in particular really inspired me to, to feel proud about where I come from and to write and sing about it. The terrace streets were my grand canyons. The shipyard cranes were my redwood trees. Those steelwork tips were my mountain ranges. And the brickyard ponds were my seven seas. Great miles, my Eldorado. Great, great to have the picture of Graham as well. Thank you very much, Andy, for supplying that. I didn't bring one with me. Um, I'm, I'm going to mention that, that that's a clip from the, the first um, radio feature I was involved with uh, and I said at the start of this talk that I'm an accidental folk singer I'd never had in my wildest dreams imagined that I'd end up presenting and contributing to, to radio um, features uh, especially on the BBC and um, I think if we'd have known that as 17 year olds in that pub uh, nearly 20 years ago we'd have probably thought more carefully about our band name and the reason we've got this really ridiculous name that gets worse with every lost hair and passing year is because that's what people called us. We were the youngest people in that singing, in that singing room, in that sing around by about 40 years. And people just said, oh, we've got some young uns in or some young ones or young people. I think it was easier for them than learning three names, to be honest. Um, so, I mean, if, we, if we'd have known then that, we, we, we'd, that this was going to become a career and that in 15 years down the line, uh, BBC continuity announcers were going to stumble over our embarrassing name and say, like, next on Radio 4, the young ends, the young guns. Uh, we'd have probably thought very more carefully about what we call ourselves. But Graham Miles was this, this, this tremendous beacon and, and really inspired me to, 
to try and do what he did to, to find stories of my North East heritage and, and turn them into songs. And uh, about 2006, 2007, I was living in a shed in Hartlepool. Um, it was at the bottom of my mum and dad's garden. They called it a log cabin, but it was, it was pretty much a shed. And um, I was drinking in the pubs of Hartlepool and I was hearing stories that fishermen would tell me and I was trying my best to turn them into songs. And we used to run our own, our own singing session in, in a pub called the Harbour of Refuge, right overlooking Hartlepool Bay. And um, we really kind of developed our singing style, I suppose, and, 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 and began to get reputation for, for writing local songs. Um, and one night, we were doing a gig in Somerset in 2015 at Clevedon in Somerset. And after the show, an old man approached us with a picture. It was a, a photo from the 1930s, a scruffy looking teenage lad with a flat cap and a cheeky grin selling a newspaper on a street corner. And the man said, this is my dad. And then he took out a piece of paper from his pocket and said, and that's what my dad did. There you go might be a song in there for you and um, when we read the paper it, it read like a, a checklist of some of the most defining moments of working class history in the 1930s and 40s his dad's name was Johnny Longstaff he was born in Stockton on Tees like me and on the list were things like when he was 15 he walked 240 miles to London looking for a job he joined a hunger march uh, three months later, he organised his first strike at a YMCA-affiliated youth hostel. He didn't even know what a strike was. Um, when he was 16, he was at the Battle of Cable Street in 1936, standing up to Oswald Mosley's black-shirted fascists. When he was 17, he lied about his age and volunteered to fight against fascism in the Spanish Civil War. He was wounded three times, he was temporarily blinded. When he got back to England, he managed to somehow meet Churchill and the House of Commons and told Churchill how he was determined to take this fight against fascism. And a few years later, he was in the Second World War when he was at El Alamein and Monte Cassino. It was an extraordinary life. And his son, Duncan Longstaff, had come along to our show that night hoping that he could persuade us to write a song about his dad, Johnny Longstaff, who died in the year 2000. But then he said, well, in 1986, Johnny actually recorded his story in his own words for the Imperial War Museum. And if you go to this website, you'll find six hours of Johnny telling his story in his own words. And it was like opening a treasure chest. It was wonderful. And once I'd listened, to those six hours of Johnny in his Teesside accent telling his story. Um, I just knew that one song wouldn't be enough and I ended up writing 17 songs. And um, seven years later, it's become a, a theatre show, The Ballad of Johnny Longstaff. But when we were talking about this and, and, and I was starting to write the songs, the inspiration was always the radio ballads. We never imagined it being a live show we never imagined certainly didn't imagine it being in theatres it was always going to be Johnny's voice and songs um, interspersed weaving in and out of it and um, it was it was a, a real labour of love writing it um, and it, it, all the kind of arrows were pointing in the right direction you know it, it was a, a chronological sweep it just felt so um, that the right thing to do was to follow that chronological order so there'd be a song about Johnny growing up in poverty in Teesside in the 20s and begging for bread without any shoes on his feet. There'd be a song about when he joined the hunger marches and walked to London. There'd be a song about that strike at the YMCA. There'd be a song about Cable Street. There'd be a song about volunteering to go to Spain. And we didn't just have the voice, we had the family's um, support. And we also had every other week in the post, boxes would arrive of books that used to belong to Johnny himself, that had his name in the margin, that had his little corrections in the margin. Oh, that didn't happen, I was there. Um, we had his own, his own photo collection and we had dozens of emails from different family members with, with beautiful, hilarious, moving stories. Um, going to play you a, a, a clip now um, about, uh, it, 
it, it's it's a clip of one of the songs in the show, and it's um, it's called Carry in the Coffin, and it's uh, a song about Johnny's experiences on that hunger march. See, I didn't know uh, until I started looking into it that there were many marches, hunger marches, when throughout the 1930s, when thousands of working men and women uh, petitioned the government for support. The famous one is the Jarrow Crusade of 1936, but there were many others, and Johnny was there in 1934. And Johnny said in his, in his testimony for the Imperial War Museum that as they marched along, they would make up songs and they would often put them to popular tunes of the time, like John Brown's Body. Um, so it just felt like Johnny was almost asking us uh, to do that very thing. Um, so I think we're going to play that clip now. And I think I've, I've talked so long, Pete, that the, uh, the screen's gone off, isn't it? Um, but you're going to see a, a clip of... of uh, the latest carnation of, of the Johnny Longstaff show, which is um, uh, a video from the Northern Stage Theatre in Newcastle, who were the partner we, we, uh, we made the show with. I might just have to sing it myself. <laughs> <laughs> It was sitting there, wasn't it? Just ready to go. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and we're, we're very, um, we're very pleased to, that on the uh, the first of May, um, the show is going to be um, on Radio Three. We made a live recording of it in front of an audience a couple of weeks ago. So Sunday, the first of May at seven thirty. It's in the the drama on free slot. Um, maybe while we're trying to get this uh, clip up, I'll say that, talk a little bit maybe about the, the kind of uh, editing that we had to do because that, although we had six hours of Johnny telling his story, um, because it was in, a, in an interview format, for example, where were you born, Mr. Longstaff? Stockton on Tees. What year was that? 1919. Rather than Johnny saying, I was born in Stockton in 1918. It meant when we started to put it together and piece uh, the feature together, we, we, had, we had gaps, gaps that we were hoping to, um, to get around. Uh, right, I think we're, are we ready, Pete? Brilliant. Let's have Carry in the Coffin. We're carrying the coffin all the way to London town. <laughs> carrying the coffin. We're carrying. Come on, Johnny. We were constantly. Him again. <laughs> we're Carrying the coffin all the way to London town. Carrying the coffin all the way to London town. Carrying anyway, so um, it, well, it goes, it goes like this. Um, carrying the coffin all the way to London town. See, the other men were the coffin all the way to London town. Carrying the coffin all the way to London town, and we will work once more. In our coffin is a man who went to war He came back a hero boy, he's beaten, broken, and sore He pawned all his medals, lads, because he was so poor And he can't work no more Carrying the coffin all the way to London town Carrying the coffin all the way to London town Carrying the coffin all the way to London town And we will work once more Oh, lo lovely rhythmic clap in there. Oh, thank you! <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so, yes, we, it, so we, we had a big job to do, kind of editing-wise, and, and, and David in particular, uh, David Eagle, my bandmate, he did a, a fantastic job kind of piecing together because Johnny as a man of a certain age uh, who was determined to tell his story went off at wild tangents throughout the six hours and trying to piece it together was a real kind of labour of love for David 
And, but it also meant that we, um, we had this issue, this problem of, um, well, we had some gaps and we need to kind of explain the story. And, and that led to the fact that the three of us would also add little bits of narration here and there into the piece as well. Um, and incredibly, at the, after listening to, listening to six hours of Johnny telling this, this amazing story, the story of his journey through the change in political landscapes of the 1930s, at the, at the very end of the recording, he, he describes returning to Spain in 1981, almost 40 years after he was last there, and how the people of Spain had not forgotten the sacrifices that Johnny and the international volunteers who went to defend democracy in Spain, the sacrifices that they had made. And at the end of these six hours, Johnny's voice breaks and, and suddenly, completely unexpectedly, he starts to sing. And um, when we were putting the, 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 the show together, we decided that it, it had to end on Johnny's, Johnny singing the song and, and us kind of accompanying him. Accompanying him. Shall we have another go, Pete? Let's have a try, shall we? <laughs> Here we go. The Spanish people came out of their houses. The Spanish people have never forgot us and never will forget us, as I will never ever forget the Spanish people. There's a valley in Spain called Rama. It's a place that we all know so well. It is there that we gave of our manhood And most of our brave comrades fell There's a valley in Spain called Carama It's a place that we all know so well It is there that we gave of our manhood and most of our brave comrades fell. I must have heard that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I've heard him sing that hundreds of times and it still, still touches me. Um, very conscious of time. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to move on to, to a, another feature that was very... Um, privileged to be able to make um, two years ago, but I, I'm conscious that if you, you might have questions about Johnny Longstaff, but I'm, if I talk about this final thing for, for another five minutes and then we might have time for a couple of questions about that or, or whatever you want. Um, in more recent years, I've, I've kind of focused on trying to write folk songs to more contemporary stories, contemporary issues, and um, Lizzie Foster, who's the wonderful producer who I've been so privileged to be able to work with over the past years. Indeed, every clip I've played or every feature we've done has been, has been with Lizzie driving it. Um, and we had this idea that, well, it, t it, it happened with me just by chance hearing a programme that she'd made several years ago. I was in the car and I was listening to a program, I can't remember the, the name of it, but it was Maxine Peake, the great Maxine Peake, the actor, and she was interviewing real people who she and other people had portrayed on screen and on stage and what they thought about it those people how they were involved in the process it was fascinating and it, it kind of struck a real chord with me because it, many songs i've written over the recent years have been about real real life people indeed who have suffered tragedy and, and trauma and, and and trying to share their stories, getting that their blessing to share the story, coming to a conclusion that someone like me could be able to share their story, if that's the right or wrong thing to do. All those kind of questions became the idea behind this program. And Lizzie had the idea that maybe, well, you see, usually what happens when I decide to write um, a song about a real person. I wouldn't dream of telling them about it until I knew it was the right thing to do and that I was satis satisfied that it was the right thing to do and I'd given everything towards it and then I would tentatively approach the person and say, 
I've written this song about you. I, I, I'd really like you to hear it. And, and if you say, oh, that's a bit, you know, I'm not comfortable with that, well, that's where it ends. Um, because I, and also because some songs are never finished. I embark upon songs and I just hit a brick wall and can get no further. But we had the idea that, well, maybe, what if we, what if we approach someone beforehand and say, we've got this idea, we'd love to sing, write a song about, about you. And, and a friend had been telling me for years that I really should try and write a song about Richard Moore from Northern Ireland. And should we have the next clip, please, Pete? The, which one, sorry? Um, it's, yeah, clip number four. Four? Yeah. So we're going to hear Richard telling his story. On the 4th of May 1972, I got out of school as normal and me and my friends were just having a race. As I ran along the bottom of the football pitch, a British soldier fired a rubber bullet at the group of children. And the, the rubber bullet hit me on the bridge of the nose. I lost my right eye, was permanently blinded in my left eye. And uh, I was only about 10 feet away from the lookout post when he fired it. Mm. So I was knocked out instantly and the next thing I remember was um, I woke up and I was lying on the school canteen table where my music teacher, Mr. Giles Doherty, he heard the bang, he ran over and he found me lying on the ground. He lifted me and carried me in and put me on the school canteen table. And I, I remember him saying to me, you know, what's your name, son? And I told him my name was Richard Moore. And he got a bit of a shock because he knew me very well, but he wasn't able to identify me uh, because of the injuries. And then the next thing I remember is I woke up in the ambulance and I remember my daddy was holding my hand and he kept saying, you'll be all right, Richard, you'll be okay. What happened to you in, was it 2007, when you actually incredibly managed to meet the, the soldier who actually had fired the rubber bullet that day? You know, I always wondered about the soldier, always wondered who he was. You know, um, through a documentary, the production company tracked Charles down. So I met him and, you know, they sit at a table opposite the man that blinded me for life and caused all those hurts to me and my family all those years ago it was an amazing thing. It was a nerve wracking experience in a, in a quiet way. And I remember reading that when you went to meet him, you had a picture of your mum and dad in, in your pocket with you. Ah, well, you know, I went to meet Charles on my own, but I felt I would, you know, like my mummy and daddy to be with me in some way, you know. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I wanted the only with me. And yeah. so I also wanted Charles to kind of see the faces of the people yeah. Behind me, the people that suffered as well. Yeah. And not to make them feel guilty, just to some way realise that they were two lovely people, you know? And yeah. so should I never have produced the photographs, I was happy that they were there in my pocket. Yeah. The incredible story of, of Richard Moore. Um, I'm very conscious of, of, of time and um, just to kind of bring you the full kind of, to round off that, that feature in that clip, um, having Richard's blessing at the very beginning was really, was really, really affirming. Um, but it didn't really, it didn't really change anything about the process of writing the song because he, he talked to me for an hour that, that day and um, I'd also, I'd read his book three times, I'd listened to every interview he'd, he'd ever done. I knew the story and, and how he tells it so beautifully. Um, and I think at, at any point in the process I could have picked up the phone and said, oh Richard, can I ask you a question about this or that? But it, it never felt right. Um, and um, Writing the song was, well, it, would, it, it took a process of, of, of months and months and, and I tried to get different ways of, of, of telling it, different ways to, to look at it. And, and in the end, I kind of went back to basics and thought, well, I've got to just get everything down and it's going to be, a, and it ended up being like 10 verses. 
um, which I managed to cut down to eight. And, and I just wanted to kind of focus on the, you know, the incredible beauty of some of the words he used and, 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 and the stories that, that meant so much to him. I mean, for example, his, his dad, his, his dad, upon hearing that his, his son had, was going to lose his sight, said to the surgeons in 1972, well, can I give him my eyes? Uh, and indeed, that's, that's the name of Richard's autobiography, Can I Give Him My Eyes? Um, we're coming to the end of the time, but if you do want to hear the, the song, the programme does conclude with, with a shortened version of it, and you hear Richard's reaction to it as well. Um, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to take a couple of questions if anyone, if anyone has any at this point. Yeah. The tunes to the songs um, is a good question. How do you go about writing the tunes to the songs? Um, well, as you know, um, I'm an accidental folk singer who can't understand music still. Uh, but folk music is, is we're so privileged to have access to a whole jukebox of, of material. And so when I do embark on on songs, I always look at what's come before. And so if this was a song that was set in Derry, I wanted to know as many folk songs from Derry as possible. And they kind of informed a little bit. I mean, at one, at one point, I had a version of it to the tune of The Streets of Derry. Um, but I gave up on that. But there's still a little lyrical reference in there, which not many people might get. But for me, it's kind of part of it. Um, some people uh, say, well, what, what comes first? And the lyrics are the or the melody and for me it's it's neither it's it's the idea it's the impulse um and so some some tunes are kind of everything's sort of in my head really um but because i'm not writing anything down i can i can sing a song to myself and then i'll take it to mike and david in the band and i'll, I'll sing it and then they'll say oh yeah i wrote like that and then we'll have a cup of tea or something and then i'll sing it again and they'll say that's completely different you know <laughs> but that's the thought process, I suppose. Um, thank you. Is there any other questions? Yeah. Hi. How did you get to team up with Lizzie Foster? How did that first feature come about? Um, it was um, it was in a pub. Um, <laughs> most of my things seem to happen in pubs. No, no. What it was, it was um, she was doing a program uh, with with Mark Radcliffe. Um, who we who we knew because he presents the folk show on Radio Two, and we'd um, we'd been invited to sing on that. And he was doing a he was walking the Pennine Way. Well, he wasn't walking it; he was being driven it, and he was popping up in different places. and And he met us in uh, um, what was the name of the pub, the Greenhead, I think. And we were we were going along to talk about our connection to the Pennines and our kind of connection to the the River Tees, which starts in the Pennines. And we talked about Graham Miles, and we had this wonderful night, and Lizzie was producing that. And once we'd told the story of Graham Miles, it was then her idea to say, well, this, this Graham story should be told and explored. And that was the first, the first chapter on our, on our relationship. Thanks. Is that about it for time? Thanks, Kelly. Oh, one more question, yeah. In the uh, Birmingham City archive of Charles Parker, uh, there's a character named Bob Cooney, who also went to f Spain and fought in the Civil War, yeah. and is also a singer. That's right. So, uh, <coughs> Unfortunately, Pam Bishop will give you the, the uh, web address if you want it. What was the last bit you said, sorry? Pam Bishop was here somewhere. Yeah. We'll yeah. Give you the, I, Pam's, Pam's given me a book, and I've, indeed, I've written a song about Bob Cooney. That's part of the Johnny Longstaff show. There's a there's a story, There's a song called Bob Cooney's Miracle. But yeah, <laughs> well, thank you very much for asking that, and thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. Uh, inspiring, amazing stuff. Another hand for Sean Cooney. Thank you, Sean. Okay, so um, in the 60s, 
Charles Parker, with a journalist called um, Dilly Piro, made two more groundbreaking and impactful programs, which looked at the experience of growing up as an Asian teenager in Birmingham in the 60s. Our next guest today has examined youth culture in a similar-ish way, but in a more contemporary setting. Um, he went to Mumbai with a binaural recorder and uh, recorded a big open-air party and from that experience created two programmes called Indian Rave for Radio 4. So to tell us about it and hopefully play us some clips, uh, please welcome from Overcoat Media, Stephen Rajam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. And it's great to be here celebrating Charles Parker in person again for, you know, first time in three years, which is terrific. Um, as I say, my name's Stephen Rajam. I'm the creative director of Overcoat Media, which is an indie based uh, near Cardiff. Um, it's great to hear so many stories and to hear so many makers from across the UK as well in the nominees just at the beginning. It's a kind of reminder that though sometimes it feels it, uh, our broadcasting kind of radio and audio industry isn't completely rooted in London and that we've got some great makers across the whole of the country. Um, till 2018, in fact, the, pretty much the year that Indian Ray was made, I was a staff producer with the BBC, making programmes for Radio 3, Radio 4 and the World Service. And my background's really in classical music originally, not in journalism or, if you like, uh, documentary making. And I mention that just because, you know, the BBC's got a very long and very proud history in news journalism. I mean, you know, you look at the coverage of the Ukraine crisis right now, it's still seen around the world as a bastion of news, and, and quite rightly so. Um, but I do think that slightly skews the way it sometimes perceives audio documentary and uh, podcast content. I mean, there's, there's often a real focus on kind of thesis and content and rigour. They're all good things, don't get me wrong, but they can come at the expense of musicality, feeling, um, poetry, and above all, kind of human experience. And Charles Parker was a real pioneer of fusing those elements in documentary storytelling. And I hope, I sort of like to see myself as part of that tradition, uh, making programs that really make you feel, that kind of move and inflame your senses as much as kind of educate you. And I do, th I think often some of the you know, best and some of the most fascinating program makers um, often have a background in kind of music and poetry and the humanities, um, musicality that really kind of makes their work sing, as it did with Charles's work. Right, that's a little bit about me and what kind of makes me tick. I'm going to play you some clips, some quite long clips actually, from a two-part Radio 4 feature I made in 2017, kind of just mentioned, Indian Rave, um, which I think captures some of the things I've just mentioned. And I think, as, as we just heard, sort of tries to capture contemporary experience of India for young people. And it's sort of about a musician and DJ called Nuclear, this chap. If you look carefully, I'm somewhere in the background holding an H4 there. Um, he uses... It's sort of, he, he's this guy, he's um, basically India's breakout star of dance music. He plays all over the world. He uh, briefly had a show on One Extra here in the UK. Um, and he, one of the things that's fascinating about Nuclear is that whereas dance music in India has always been, as I guess it is in some parts of the world, as other parts of the world as well, um, rather privileged. It's, you know, club, club culture, you know, people, there's an economic thing there, you have to have money to get into nightclubs. He plays big open air gigs to people across class and caste boundaries. Um, and he makes a point of trying to do that for, you know, some of, his, some of those gigs, are for, uh, you know, for free. And he has this huge kind of cross society appeal. And I found that really fascinating. Um, and so I wanted to make a program that used his music and testimony to convey lived experience. There's something kind of fascinating I found about how just as, you know, we find in, in folk music, as Sean's been talking about, you know, how there's a real reflection of lived experience. It, it felt to me that in some ways his music conveyed something, or sort of the experience of his music conveyed something about what it's like to be a young Indian today in the 21st centuries and the changing aspects of that society. And more than that, I wanted to really make the listener feel the intensity and head rush of that experience to kind of convey joy 
um, a lot of when we, when we kind of um, make programs that are very much rooted in personal testimony, they're often about very serious subjects. We've, we heard, some, heard um, some examples earlier, and that's really, really important. It takes us into that world, and it can be very uh, sobering and dark. But of course, serious subjects aren't always completely serious, even in the darkest of times. Life isn't always completely, completely serious, even the darkest times. Music is an escape. So I'm going to play a clip from the beginning of the first program. This is about six minutes, so it's quite a long clip. Um, hope you enjoy. How's it looking? How's the crowd? Okay, great. It's 10 previous set by about 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Yeah? Okay. Okay, okay see you in a bit. Let's take a hypothetical. Is DJ Say you're a big music industry guy. You're a manager. Your promoter, you own an agency. What the hell is going on in India? Hello? Rishabh, listen, I want to know how many people are there, what's the turnout like? Just figure out, no? Did you know that Pharrell is in Bombay today? I want to know how the other shows are going. No rush, no rush. Just ask yes. around. It's going to take you about four minutes to find nuclear. Electronic music is the music of this generation. The 60s had rock, the 80s and 90s had hip hop, and electronic music is very much the music of the noughties, of now. Here's a musician who makes the music of now, but makes it in a way that is rooted in his own country. sort of primal instinct in the people in India. Very dignified people are suddenly trusting and grinding and going completely insane. Nobody has enjoyed this level of duality. We did a gig in Ahmedabad. At 5 p.m., there were 10,000 people outside the gates. They broke the gates, hordes and hordes and hordes of people, and there were like shoes on the ground. They ran so fast that a lot of their shoes came off. That's the mania that he's created in India. <laughs> It doesn't matter if you're the biggest Bollywood star in the country or you're a kid from Dharavi from the biggest slum in Asia. Everybody recognizes him and knows his name and what he's about. So the venue is not too far away, I'm guessing. 20 minutes. 20 minutes from now. That means 4, okay. 4. I've, 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 I've moved the set time already to 4.30. 4.30. We'll be able to make it. We have 10 minutes buffer now. Inshallah. Mm. <laughs> uh, this is definitely not a normal day in my life. I'm here to play at a Holi party in Bombay. Holi is a festival of colors. People come out, they party, and uh, there are multiple holy parties happening all across India. This is uh, one of the biggest holy parties in Bombay, where I'm headlining. Right, guys. You guys need to give them some time. You guys need to give them some time. Four o'clock was the first set time, and I've just landed, and four it's four o'clock right now. <laughs> so they just done some magic. They just my manager. He's done some magic, and uh, now the new set time is 4:30. And I'm late. <laughs> I'm ready. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise. The Jamal Nuclear! Hi, my name is Udyan. Come on, Bombay! And I make music under the name of Nuclear. Are you ready? Let's start with Happy Holi! The minute he starts playing, suddenly the crowd goes completely crazy. They've taken off their clothes, they're throwing shirts in the air. It's tabla and dhol, raw percussion, wild beats. We want to, you know, create disturbance on the streets, create a ruckus. That's what Indian music really is. <laughs> Okay, explain this question again to me, yeah? Honestly, if you go to any city in this country, 
where there are young people who have money in their pocket, a cell phone, and they're connected to the internet, they are not interested in what their parents did, they're not interested in their family business, they're not interested in what the traditions are that they have had to live their life by. What they are interested in is what is the newest song that came out on the radio yesterday? What club can I get into right now? How much is a drink gonna cost me? And is the next pretty girl gonna be there? That is the reality of what young people in this country are experiencing. 600 million smartphone users, extremely cheap data rates, and telecom providers that are trying to drive that data rate down every day. And 65% of this country's population is below the age of 35. Connect the dots here. They're young, they speak English, they have connectivity to the internet, and cash in their pockets. What happens next? Entertainment, baby. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I remember when that first went out, looking at Twitter, and someone tweeted, I don't know what the hell is going on on Radio 4 right now, but I like it. So that's, that's something. Um, so look, I hope in that sequence, as I said, it's the opening of the first program, you get a sense that this is going to blend not just nuclear story, but there's something bigger going on here about the experience, about what it's like to be young in contemporary India, and also something else about the tension between kind of art and human experience on one hand and globalization, the, the push of the digital world and the commercial world on the other hand. Um, I'm really proud of that opening. I think it's probably one of the best things I've ever done. And um, it kind of, I hope it really punches you in the guts. I sometimes think radio doesn't, radio is a really visceral medium and it should kind of, kind of hit you a bit. Um, the great feature maker, Piers Plowright, who sadly passed away recently, um, once said, I remember being at a thing where he said, um, a, a really good radio documentary only really needs two things, heart and woof. <laughs> and I hope that had woof. Um, so one of the things you'll notice about that, the doc is there's obviously no presentation or narration. There's no voice trying to guide or steer you. And that was a conscious decision from the very, very outset. Um, one I had to fight quite hard for, even, even two days before I delivered the final mix. I had my boss kind of skipping around saying, are you sure you couldn't just put a little bit of script in? Um, but I resisted because I, I really wanted to create something that had the kind of, to create the effect, that had the illusion, the impression of contributors speaking directly to the listener, to take away that kind of curtain between the, the radio and, and the listener, um, and not tell us what we should think or get in the way. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the narration. Narration can be an incredibly useful tool to kind of elevate and enhance a listener's experience. But one of the key elements of this program, and you'll hear this in this next clip, is testimonies, the actual lived experience of young people in India. And these kind of weave around nuclear story and the ideas and experiences that they convey sort of dovetail, the two stories dovetail. And the reason behind that was, I really feel strongly, we never hear authentically what it's like to be young, um, least of all in places like India, but you know, at home, you know, in the UK as well. When we do, it's always mediated. It, it's told through somebody else. You know, here's a report on what it's like to be a young person. Uh, I'm such and such, and I'm reporting on it. Or I'm presenting this. I, I wanted to meet them, um, these young people I met, talk about what mattered to them, and try to capture the reality of their lives, kind of without editorialising too much over it. So look, here's a clip from a few minutes on from there, from what we just heard, and the first of the Indian teenagers we hear in the programme. This is a young woman called Somya. In general, it is hard for the older generation to cope up with our generation. What they did in their times was so much different than what we do in our times. My name is Somya. I'm 19 years old. Currently, I'm studying in my first year law. I'm doing law. I'm a really, I could say, I, I'm a really manipulative person. Like, if I want something my way, I'm good with words. I can convince someone to think 
in the way which I want them to think in, which I think is a very important quality for a lawyer and I'm really argumentative by nature too. My mom really doesn't want me to get into criminal law because she feels that for a woman, criminal law is not the ideal. She feels like you'll have to deal with people from different backgrounds. Like my own mom saying that. I just, I get really angry. Trying to please everyone should not be someone's aim in life. Always being pleasant and putting on a smile on your face even when you disagree with something is what no woman should do, no one should do. Forget women. If I do get riled up, I'm sure people will say she's not very ladylike. But I think that's being really fake. And I can't be fake. I was in the 10th grade when I decided that I wanted to get into music. <laughs> I found some like-minded friends with whom I formed my first band, Bandish Project. Bandish means composition. He took his time. I think what's interesting about him is that younger kids might think, oh, he's just become this overnight sensation, but he has had about a decade or so of trying different things. Like My name's Amit Gurbaksani and I'm a music journalist following the Indian independent music scene for about two decades now. And over the last five, I've been closely following Nuclear's rise to superstardom. You know, he had years of struggle of fusing his elements and getting to make and shaping a form of Indian electronic music that's distinct from anything out there. And I think when he finally realized that, that would work for him, he just kind of ran with it. Uh, the sound of Bandish Project was a mix of Indian classical music and broken beats, very glitchy electronic music. There were about one, two, three DJs in the band. One of the guy was a percussionist as well. His name is Mayur Narpikar. Mayur is a tabla player. And Mayur actually was a guy who taught him about music. A lot of his growing up years he spent with Mayur, they actually did pretty well for themselves. They lived in Dubai for a while. I think they went lived in London for a while, uh, came back. And I think after like maybe 10 years of making music together, I mean, uh, Mayur still carried on with Bandish project. But Udyan, nuclear, he really didn't have anything. Him being a tabla player, I had a completely different perspective towards music and Mayur had a completely different perspective towards music. I wasn't trained in, in classical music at all and I wanted to experiment with other forms of music. It kind of happened in a, in a destructive way where we were not happy with each other's decision. All the shows which were lined up for the band, I I couldn't play those. So A, I'm broke. Emotionally, I was broke as well. And B, there's no work. And C, I'm married now. I had no reference. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. After I moved out of Bandish Project, it was a little difficult, to be honest with you. One thing which I need to improve about myself is my anger. I get angry really fast, especially when it comes with my parents and I say things which I regret later. And I don't mean at that moment, but I just don't think before speaking because I'm so heated up at that moment and I just can't think of anything else but to hurt them. We've yelled, we've screamed, I've told him harsh things. He's told me harsh things. You just want to party, that's all you want to do. You're going to get nowhere in life, the regular things that parents say. I tell the parents, I just ask them one simple question. Do you, do you love your children? They will say, obviously, we do. Do you want your children to be happy? Yes, they do. But at the end, however cliche as this may sound, happiness lies in following what you want to do. So I hope that sort of sequence gave just a sense of how ideas kind of flow between the, the stories in a way that I hope is sort of subtle and suggestive. You, you have Somya talking about the importance of not being fake and then you hear about Nuclear's early life and his own kind of musical voice, him falling out with his partner and then Somya talking about her own sort of feelings about her own anger and how she feels, you know, how, to, how she has to be herself and, you know, and how that, so there's a kind of dovetailing but really what I want is for listeners to 
to connect the dots themselves and actually to sort of hopefully connect up other dots that I didn't even know was there, um, that I might not even thought of. And, and you see, that's the joy, that's the amazing thing about montage and non-narrated pieces. Um, there's a kind of danger that we can sometimes think of them as sort of rather impressionistic uh, or arty, a kind of a string of testimonies. And, and that's fine, they, 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 you know, there's a place for that, but the, I think some of the best pieces of montage, and Charles Parker was a maestro at this, they weave together really big ideas in a way that feels small and human and immediate. I'm just going to play you a very short, much shorter piece of testimony for another teenager um, that I met. And again, it plays with this idea of the tension between art and staying true to yourself and commercial reality. So this is Shiva, who I met outside the factory where he works. And Shiva dreams of being a nature photographer. Wildlife. Wildlife is like love. <laughs> it's like life. My name is Shiva. My age is 18. Mostly in wildlife, I love snakes, which is very dangerous, but I don't care. What is my passion? Photography. That's what I do. Birds are so colourful. Like, if you know that kingfish or bird, like the small one, woodpeckers and everything, they are so colourful. That's what I love. Try to capture by what they feel. Like, what they feel, actually, we can't feel it. That's what I captured. My friends are like crazy. <laughs> when I see people study, 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 I feel like I'm sorry for them, like, seriously. I'm like, I feel sorry for you. I can't say anything to the parents or to them because their parents are thinking that study is everything. So that's, that's what. Study is not everything. You can do whatever you want. The only thing is like, you will get job. And what, 15, 20k is nothing for me. Yeah, I have to earn more. 15 minutes is nothing. <laughs> In weddings, you can earn hundreds of thousands. That's very good. Like, but I don't like wedding, you know. I like into wildlife and everything, and I don't know how to click a picture of human properly. <laughs> That's what. If, I, if there is a snake, I'll click it, I'll crawl it, and I'll do anything. But of a human, I don't know that much, yeah. So that was Shiva. Um, you might have noticed before, I said the program gives the impression of speaking directly to the listener. And I use that word in deliberately, deliberately because in truth, this program, in fact, any program, it's not unmediated. No piece of radio is, unless you're literally broadcasting raw audio. It's, it's highly mediated by, by me, the producer. Um, this is put together by it from hours and hours and hours of tape and sort of sculpted into a story that I felt captured something truthful and meaningful uh, about the people and also that captured something of the kind of visceral sensory kind of poetry of being in India. And I'm not sure how, you know, each of us might feel about that because there's all sorts of questions wrapped up in there. People have strong, quite strong feelings about what a documentary is, what's, what's real, what's fiction. Uh, fic fiction. Um, what's mediated, what's not, what's documentary and what's art, what's truthful and what's, if not false, I guess, slightly manipulated. And there's, there's no easy answer to that. But what I would say is that if we do acknowledge that everything we make, everything we produce is to some extent mediated, then I think your role as a feature maker, as a documentary maker, isn't to sort of necessarily slavishly portray testimonies or ideas without mediating them. It's to sculpt them thoughtfully and sensitively to somehow, into something that somehow brings your audience even closer to a deeper and more vivid experience. Um, at the risk of being a bit teasing, something even more truthful than the truth, perhaps. Um, look, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm just going to play out with the opening of the second part. And you'll hear Nuclear's manager again, Ted, who I won't lie, he's to some extent the kind of beating heart of these programs. Um, and at the very end, just a tiny bit of this clip from um, a young man called Harsh. If you tune in, if you find this online, there's lots more of Harsh in the second program. He's a lovely guy, fascinating, and he just had the sweetest soul of a poet. Um, thank you very much. We'll play clip five. What Bombay is, is the definition of organized chaos. Everything is in your control and nothing is in your control at the same time. It's quite special and it's quite unique and it's something that draws a lot of people here. And the really remarkable part is 
they show up here with stars in their eyes, they might actually win. India is not just about poor people on the street. And India is not just about poverty. And India is not just about overpopulation. There's a youth quake happening in India, and it's happening right now. Almost a fifth of the world's population, more than 50% below the age of 25. It's a marketing man's dream. People who are not from India don't actually get to see that. They imagine India from a movie that they've watched, the brown-skinned man who speaks in a very funny accent. That's not the country we live in. There are different kinds of people in India. Many kinds of people. Good, bad, bad, good, good, bad. Yeah. So, what should I talk about next? Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, that's Stephen Rajan. Thank you very much. And as you could see from the screen grab, it's uh, still available to listen to um, on BBC Sands. So check those programmes out. Has anybody been gazing? Oh, well, you're too young to be gazing nostalgically. I sadly am at the age where I learn how to edit on something similar to this. Have you been? I had a chance to have a look at. Got some gorgeous old vintage uh, little reel-to-reel -reel machine. I don't probably can't see this, those of you watching on the stream, but some beautiful pictures of Charles Parker and some great old bits of kit, mobile recording kit and a microphone. Um, I'm hoping that our next guest will be able to hopefully tell us a little bit more about these. Um, so let's welcome him to the stage, a Charles Parker Trust trustee and course leader here at Birmingham City University. A warm welcome for Sam Coley. So uh, it's taken a while, but it's great to have you all here finally at Birmingham City University. I think we've had, what, three attempts to, to <laughs> have the event here. Um, I'm not going to take too long today. Uh, I really want to hand the stage over to our um, past winners from the Charles Parker Award. Um, but I do want to take a little bit of time uh, for us to acknowledge and honour Brian Vorton, who worked with Charles uh, and who captured some of the sounds of Birmingham's history. Now, Brian passed away in September 2020. I'll be honest, I didn't know that much about him until the trust contacted me about finding a possible home for some of Brian's old equipment. Uh, and to cut a long story short, we now have Brian's EMI midget recorder, his editing unit, and a microphone outside our, our radio studios that he worked. You can see them on display there. Um, we will have some coffee after. You can come and have a, a closer look if you want. Uh, and this is... Um, the editing unit that Charles used at home. I think that's right, Sarah. So uh, we've got this in our um, auditorium as well, and we're delighted to um, be, you know, the holders of these wonderful items. So in 1961 and 1962, Brian and Charles made two radio programs that came to be known as the Birmingham Ballads. Brian wrote the introductions and recorded the raw audio while Charles edited and produced them and worked with the mu musicians who featured on uh, the programs, including Ian Campbell, his sister Lorna, and Rosemary Redpath. Now, let's be clear, these programs are not part of the um, uh, Radio Ballads canon, uh, but they are proudly Brummy, made here in Birmingham for a Midlands audience. And for me, what makes them particularly special is that they capture aspects of Birmingham's past uh, that have been largely lost now. So they are, in effect, audio time capsules. The first production was called The Jewellery, which focused on Birmingham's jewellery quarter. Today, the quarter is home to over 700 jewellers, but Brian's work recorded the voices of those who remembered the district's real heyday when there were over 30,000 people employed in the jewellery quarter before its decline. Brian and Charles then worked on Cry from the Cut, 
a program about the boat people who lived and worked on Birmingham's canals, a way of life that had begun to die out in the 50s due to increased competition from rail and motorways. So there's a sort of a theme in these works, and as Brian wrote himself, on looking back, I find that the majority of my documentaries have been aimed at capturing the past before it's too late. So before I play some extracts from these productions, I wanted to play a clip of an interview that I recorded with my colleague Vanessa Jackson back in 2014, um, where we talked to Brian, and uh, he talks here about his work with Charles and Charles's ability as a producer. My sessions with him, uh, sitting in silence while the master worked, um, you know, was going into the late hours. Um, uh, t time was of little essence. Uh, and he, he was a perfectionist. Um, you know, things would be done and redone uh, until he got it right. And of course, with all people who um, get a reputation for being a genius or a perfectionist, people would tell you that uh, he would take a driver out into the uh, countryside and then go somewhere else 20 miles away because he couldn't record the right type of silence you know which may seem extreme and probably is but you know if you get a reputation for being a perfectionist people are obviously going to have a dig at you and things like that but um, it, it didn't uh, worry him at all I mean he was the sort of guy who didn't sort of um, treat fools lightly uh, and rightly so of course uh, so it, it washed off him but um, he, he became uh, obsessed with the job in hand and um, as such his work is um, you know as perfect the editing work was as perfect as you could make it so one of the things I really um respected about Brian is that he was a freelancer. He made his own opportunities. And that's why I think he's a, a great role model for, for students today. He had a real passion for feature making, but absolutely no credentials. So he brought his own recorder, which you see over there, um, a considerable investment back then. And he worked his way up, as he said, the radio documentary ladder, uh, until he found himself working with the likes of Philip Donnell and, and Charles Parker. If you'd like to find out more about Brian and his work, it's covered in Peter Cox's excellent Set Into Song book. I'd also encourage you to visit the Charles Parker website and search for Brian. Uh, he's written some uh, fascinating recollections on working with both Donlan and Parker, uh, as well as his thoughts on the development of the radio documentary genre and uh, just production technology in general as well. So. That's all I really have time for. Uh, I just thought it was important to, to pay tribute to Brian today. Thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, I'm gonna finish with some short clips taken from the Birmingham Ballads, starting with Cry From The Cut and ending with The Jewelry. This is the Midland Home Service. We present Cry From The Cut. On the canal, we live with nature, and nature lives with us, and we love it. And every time I look at the canal, it all means something, it reminds me. I mean, I owe them something in a way, don't I? Of course, it's part of the English heritage. It never alike two days, but it's full of character, kindliness, and beauty. And I couldn't live away from the canal now. I couldn't live away from it, I'd die. I'm sure I'd die. I must go down to some lonely valley. I came across the jewellery quarter as a boy when my father bought me a bicycle, and I set out to explore the city where I was born. I'd heard so many stories about the jewellery quarter. Whether they were true or not, I still don't know. My grandfather. He was in the jewelry. I don't know how he got in. <laughs> they call this the golden mile. They call this the square mile. They call this the jewelry. It's like a bird whistling when he goes into enters the water, 
and it breaks up into these small particles. We use that grain gold for alloying other metals. I'm a one-man jeweler and I knew me trade. I'd been in the jewelry since jewelry was made. Me hands were me fortune, for fortune I'd none. The jewels I fashioned were for others to own. So um, I'd like to now call on Sarah Parker, who probably remembers this thing quite well, I would uh, imagine. Yeah, so we used to go on holiday. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> brings back a few memories. So yeah, uh, can we just introduce Sarah to the stage, please? Wonderful to have you here. Gosh, so I'm hoping that Sean Medford is here, is she? You are, yes. Okay, will you come down and join me, please? Gosh, I feel like I'm doing something like, you know, one of those shows. Come on down. Right, um, I think you've got some clips, have you? Because Sean has made this program about Birmingham today really haven't you i have yeah oh um, god so loud sorry oh. and i have to apologize to her because i have strict instructions that everything has to be short so i went through everything and i took out three little clips which are only a minute long well sort of i'm afraid i'm edited and muddled with your stuff a bit okay. because she's made this wonderful sort of organic thing that flows um but i thought we could then talk about each one so if you play the first one which comes from the beginning that would be great thank you oh by the way i must say that sham was the winner of 2019 yeah. yeah okay hey siri what time does the birmingham library open Go to <laughs> One possibility I see is Library of Birmingham on Blood, Street. You're not, you're not telling me the time. Good? Yes, what time does it open? It's closed today. Want to try that? Birmingham, known as England's second city and home to roughly 200,000 citizens, we have the good, the bad, and the ugly truths that lie within. And I think we should share a glimpse of our lives I with you. I can ask you a question about living in Birmingham. Yeah, sure, yeah. So have you been born here in Birmingham? Yes, yeah. You was? And, yeah. and if you don't mind me asking, how long have you? 55, 55 this year. That was great. I mean, the biggest change for me coming into the city centre now is a lot more people from outside mm. coming to Birmingham. When, when I was probably, you know, your age, there was all local people then. Excuse me? I don't suppose we can ask you about growing up in Birmingham. Uh, We're doing a little documentary about growing up in Birmingham and how I don't changed. know about him, but I did not grow up in Birmingham. Did you not? Where did you grow up? India. And why, why did you move to Birmingham now? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I regret it. <laughs> Do you? It's harsh, but I hate it. That's why I chose to stop there. Because yes. I wanted to ask you <laughs> why. Why do you think he said that? I think with Birmingham, it's one of those places where you either love it or you hate it. Um, and as much as, you know, I think us Birminghamers are quite nice and friendly, you can have the horrible side of it and you can, you know, experience the racism and the discrimination. So I think for him, um, obviously it goes on a lot longer, um, but he says when he moved here in the first couple of months, um, he had a really racist remark made against him. Um, so I think that's possibly why he said it. And like every place, like you have, it's ugly truths and sometimes... And is that your experience, do you think? I mean, no, I've actually really had a lovely time in Birmingham. Um, but for example, my mum, she grew up in Wales and she came here to Birmingham. Um, and again, within the first couple of months, um, she was racially attacked as well. 
So I think it, it can happen anywhere, but obviously Birmingham. Now you've got two contributors in this programme. I do, yeah. Now tell me about them. Tell me about the first one, the younger one first. Um, 24, isn't he? Yeah, so um, Rakeem Reed, he um, actually owns his business now with his other two partners, um, and it's a mentoring business. So they mentor young children who maybe are going to go down the wrong path um, because of the areas that they live in. So he grew up in a bad area. Um, I don't know if anyone from, is from Birmingham, but he grew up in Newtown, which is quite deprived. Okay, shall we hear a bit from him then? Yeah, of course you can. Okay. Now, our city Birmingham is full of amazing people that come from different areas. We've got B19, B21, B42. But the question is, should your postcode define your future? This, this is this bigger than the block. Is bigger than the block. When you used to come to town, younger, <laughs> what did you used to do? Nothing. Had no money to spend. Toffee Sunday, walking to all these stores, acting like I've got money, like I can, I'm going to buy it. Then I'd walk out the store, imagine I'd have the fresh trainers on. Well, so you said that you moved, so you originally was from Newtown, you said, any, yeah. and then moved to Great Bar. Yeah. As I said, when I was in Newtown, I'm not going to get into it now, but I was seeing some things that are horrific, and that's just a fact. It doesn't bother me. It's normalised it's what we all go through I'm not asking for sympathy because every kid has probably seen it done it been in the same shoes as I was it's just normal that is so what is that that he's talking about um, and did you deliberately not include it so he grew up um, basically in Newtown and he was going on to talk about how it got to a point where the bailiffs came to his house um, and he had to think of things that he could do to be able to make the money so that the bailiffs could go away. Um, obviously, he was in a single parent household, so he decided to go down the route of like illegal things, um, so to be able to pay basically and help his mom out. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, young children, especially well, in Birmingham and in places like Newtown, Handsworth, that's the path that they kind of go down. Okay, so how does that sort of life, if you like, now compare to the 60s? So if we listen to the third clip, again, they're really, really short and they truly don't represent the beautiful way that Sean has put this together. Um, they just represent. So if you just play the next clip now. I tell you, the first memory I have of Handsworth, Birmingham, was that they had a fair in Handsworth Park. They had marching bands, they had scouts, Girls Brigade, Boys Brigade, I'd never seen anything like that before. They march through the park all around and then onto the streets, down Grove Lane and then up to Soho Road. It was amazing. Yeah, growing up as a child, you were constantly called the Black Bee. We grew up hearing that, you know, but it wasn't even just about people being overtly racist in the school system and they actually had low expectations of you and they would actually let you know that you're going to be working in a factory yeah so how does that all fit in if we take the two together now um yeah so when i was making this i wanted to get two perspectives i wanted to get um audrea joseph she's the older generation um and again she grew up in handsworth so handsworth again is like another area where it's like Billy Fee, um, and she talks about her upbringing. And then I wanted to get the younger perspective, which is Rakeem. Um, but near enough, they're quite similar. They both kind of experienced racism or they both were kind of put down on because of the areas that they came from. And I wanted to show that that shouldn't be the case because both have gone on to do absolutely amazing things. Rax, you know, mm -hmm. he's got his mentoring and Audrey Joseph, she's wrote a book. Mm. So why do you think we haven't moved on? Or have we moved on? I think, again, it all depends on what area you come from mm -hmm. um, and what you decide to make of your life. So Rax, he realised, OK, this isn't, this isn't good. Um, so then he went on and he changed the narrative to his story. Mm -hmm. Same with Audria. Um, 
So I think it just depends on what you make of your life and which path you decide to take. And so what path are you taking, having won the Charles Parker Prize? I'm hoping the right path. 2020? Um, oh, I'm not wanting to put you on the spot. 2019. Yeah. yeah, sorry. COVID brain. Um, so I'm still doing radio. Um, I moved back to Birmingham because, yeah, I love Birmingham. Birmingham's my home. Um, and I'm still hoping to like carry on doing radio, making documentaries, um, presenting. So I'm hoping to keep going down that path. One last thing. Yeah. With the building of the blocks, because I left that in. Can you tell me about that bit of music? Because we're going to be talking about music later, I think, in one of the sessions. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really relevant piece of music that you put in. Now, where did that come from and what does it mean? Uh, is it the track where it says yeah, the building. Burning? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that track is actually by Lotto Boys um, and they're uh, Birmingham based like rappers. Mm -hmm. um, it also has JK in. So I just thought, yeah, use that because it talks about Birmingham. And if you listen to it, um, it talks about being like on the side by KFC. You have roadmen that stand there. <laughs> it talks about like McDonald's on the ramp and all of those things and Pigeon Park. All of those things are really like landmarks here in Birmingham. So I thought let's keep it in and let's showcase Birmingham's talent. Yeah. And so showcasing her talent <laughs> will actually be the whole thing will actually be on the Charles Parker thing so I hope you can listen to it at some point oh, definitely. and now I'd like to try and bring down the other winners which we've got Magdalene Morrissey who was 2021 and I had the pleasure of mentoring and Alex Alex Holm who was 2000 oh god i'm useless with years anymore <laughs> 20, 2000 22. we've been locked away too long uh, 2020 20 20 yeah, 20, 20, 19 20 21 yes so you'd like to come down too yeah so should we if you yes so starting with you alex now can you tell us a bit about the piece that you did Hang, hang on. Should she needs her mic back. Have you, it's okay, we'll share this Have you got, okay, okay. Yeah, so my radio documentary was a piece called This Ain't My Life. Um, and I went to university here, actually, at Birmingham City. And whilst I was here, um, I struck up kind of, obviously not everyone would expect it, but a friendship with a homeless man that lived on the streets. Um, and it was because I was on the way back from a night out, a little bit tipsy one day, and I saw a homeless man crying on the side. And obviously... That's not a normal sight to see a man just on the street sobbing. Um, so I struck up a conversation with him. I bought him a meal and we spoke a couple of times whenever I saw him. And then a couple of weeks later, I saw on the news that he passed away. Um, and not long after that, obviously that's something that stuck in my mind. Um, I found myself with one of my um, university courses having to make a documentary. And Sam Coley was the teacher for that. And he was talking about what's something that stuck in your mind? What's something that what's the story you want to tell? And really, th this was the only thing I wanted to tell. I wanted to use my voice to tell Kane's story. And what have you gone on to do? What do you want to do in the future? What's your... I mean, for me, until the Charles Parker Prize, I was very stuck between television or radio production. I, I didn't know which one was for me, which I was supposed to go into. And the process of, you know, working with my mentor, Simon Elms, it really did just ingrain in me, radio is what I want to do. Unfortunately, I graduated in the middle of a pandemic. There wasn't a lot of job opportunities, so I have fallen back into television production. The dark side. <laughs> <laughs> but radio is where I want to be, so hopefully when the time is right, I can make my way back there. I do love the how you got into the dark side, though. Tell the story of how you managed to get your TV job. So that's what everybody wants, really. Yeah, it was not intentional. Um, I was bored in the middle of lockdown and decided to make a TikTok account. Um, accidentally grew, you know, a base of three million followers. So I was, <laughs> it was, it was not on purpose. It just happened. It was about that. her dog. Yeah, it's my dog. It wasn't even me. I was <laughs> telling stories with my Labrador. Um, but through that was then offered a job with the independent television production company. Thank you. Anyway, congratulations. And, Thank you. Um, she's just one of the amazing people that every year I get a chance to meet, you know, okay on zoom or whatever and and we have the new storytellers so um okay so magdalene uh, okay magdalena sorry um would you like to talk a bit your piece was based in london wasn't it so yeah it was uh, sorry it's a bit loud um it was based in new course uh, where goldsmiths 
uh, is where I was studying, and it was called 40 Years on Remembering the New Crossfire. And um, I had, for a while, I'd spent six years actually researching dub music and uh, the evolution of dub music, particularly around uh, the sort of 70s and 80s. And I got to work with an organization called Decolonizing the Archive, and uh, we were looking into the 40 year anniversary of this house fire um, at a party. Um, it was a teenager's party. And it was just an incredible moment of bringing together this, uh, these um, accounts of that fire and people who were present and people looking back at it. And then also um, the storytelling through dub music. So I think um, for me, what um, made it different to some of the other stuff that went out, because it was a TV thing and another yeah. radio was the fact that you actually went on the gathering that they have every year, the sort of march or commemorative march, didn't you? Yeah. And you recorded some great sound when it was actually all happening. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was an incredible experience, actually, because I was studying in the middle of lockdown and most of my teaching had been online. I hadn't even really been to New Cross, you know, or spent much time there. And I sort of met, it was really cold, it was March, and... Um, I wasn't sure who was going to be there, if people were going to turn up, and it was just this incredible community, and there was, you know, still a lot of pain, and um, yeah, some amazing characters, and uh, we spent, I think, it was like four hours marching, and we spent an hour outside the house, and there was a priest and singing, and yeah, it was amazing. Um, and did that give you a real sense? Yeah of the actual, of what happened? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that the story still needed to be told because, I mean, I, yeah, it's just... And what do you both want to do? I think you're still going back into radio, aren't you? You're not going to stay. Oh, no, I would love to go back into radio. <laughs> so she's open to job offers. Yeah, yes, and uh, Magdalene? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to get into radio. I um, went back, I was in events before, and now I'm working at the South Bank Centre as a producer part-time, but um, I really love feature making, and I love finding and telling stories so hoping to get back into radio soon and I am exploring sort of certain stories in my spare time. So thank you and thank you all of you who've done this you know this amazing major pieces and should we can we just applaud everybody actually. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah Parker. Thank you very much. And also to Sam earlier. And uh, yeah, Sean, Alex, Magdalena, really inspiring to hear your stories. And um, congratulations to all of you. Now, we're going to shortly be finding out who's going to be sitting in that chair next year, because we are going to find out who the five winners of the 2022 Charles Parker Prize are, and of course the gold winner. So to make the announcement, uh, please welcome our next guest, a commissioning executive from BBC Radio 4, Hannah Sander. Hello, oh, this is very terrifying. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, so I'm a commissioning executive at Radio 4. Um, it's still kind of weird to me to discover that four people at Radio 4 decide what all the programmes are for the 18 hours a day all through the year for commissioning editors. Um, one does comedy, one does drama, and two do everything else. We call it factual. And then I'm sort of a fifth person, and I help them decide what all the programmes are that go out each year. Um, and I'm here representing Rich Knight, he's one of the commissioning editors who does Factual, and he listened to all these programmes and he made this decision. Um, I also listened to the programmes and I just want to say I absolutely loved them and several of them reduced me to tears, so thank you for making them. Um, so Rich gave me this, so I'm reading his words, and he says, I'll be honest, when Andy's email arrived with not 10 as usual but 11 features to listen to, my heart did sink a bit. I was looking down the barrel of several hundred unread emails, many hundreds more unread programme ideas, and, well, you get the idea. But then I listened to them, pretty much all in one go, one after another, and I was reminded that my involvement in this process on behalf of Radio 4 isn't a chore, but a gift. I loved every one of the 11 entries. Every one took me to somewhere new, 
and introduced me to people I'm pleased to have met. Basically, it was a lot more fun than answering emails and reading programme ideas. So thank you. Choosing five of them for broadcast, however, was not easy. I chose the five I have because, to my ear, they contained the most confident and effective production decisions, but it was a close call. All 11 entries are great pieces of work. There's only so much room in the Radio 4 schedule, though, so the five that will be played out on Radio 4 are Alec Anonymous by Christina Hardinge. Down on the Farm by Megan Hayward. He Wears a Mask by Guy Gardner. Breathing Lyrical by Takwa Sadiq. And The Sound Collector by Talia Augustidis. So congratulations to all five of you. One of these is the Gold Award winner. The judges couldn't decide between two possible winners and they asked me, and I'm still speaking as Rich, they asked me to be the referee. This was another very, very tough choice. But for me, the standout production here, subtle, poignant, charming, and clever, was The Sound Collector by Talia Augustinus. So, congratulations to all of you, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hannah. And, and um, yeah, please welcome Simon Elms back to the podium. Very, very, very briefly, congratulations to Talia for her fantastic, fantastic programme. It really was a wonderful piece of work, as indeed was its very, very close run contestant. We couldn't separate them. Um, Alec Anonymous was that one, and the, so between those two, it really, really was down to the wire. I wasn't, didn't feel competent to make a casting vote between them. So I, um, I bottled out and gave it to, to Rich to make that decision. But let me say to Talia that uh, the judges said this moving and original tale about the death of a mother has according to the judges, a wonderful, intriguing opening, gentle pace, and use of poetry. It's cleverly elliptical, and it's a proper feature that has great power. Now we're going to listen to a slightly longer clip, including the reveal of the author of the famous poem. It was the day he found out she died. It was over the phone. It was a stranger. And it did feel like someone came in and stole all of the sounds and just took them away. And then he had to call my godmother. And do the same to her. I don't remember being told myself. I couldn't even write my name when my mum died, let alone how I felt. So I think when I saw the poem, I just took these imagined experiences and mashed them together in my mind. And so, for my own sake, even if it is a bit childish, I'm going to take Taya's suggestion and just pretend. The Sound Collector by Taya Augustidis, read by Roger McCoff. A stranger called this morning, dressed in yellow and blue, put every sound into a bag and carried them away. The crying of the babby, the swishing of the trees, the tarning of the key, the blowing on the curtains, the curtains, the blowing on the curtains. A stranger called this morning, I found out on a Friday night at about three in the morning. It was six o'clock in the morning, it was Saturday morning. The house phone rang, I 
thought it was a bit strange and I ran to pick it up so that it wouldn't wake you up. Dimitri phoned me. He didn't leave his name. There was this voice on the other side that I didn't recognize and he said to me, have some terrible news. There's been an accident. Sally's had an accident. And unfortunately she's passed away. She's dead, Amanda. Left us only silence. I think I just started screaming. My first thought was not to scream or cry because I didn't want to wake you up. I know I started screaming because I woke everyone in the house up. We had an au pair at the time and she said when she heard me scream, she knew that it was Sally and she knew that Sally was dead. Life will never be the same. Thank you, Talia, for a wonderful programme. Thanks, Simon. Um, congratulations to all the nominees. Talia, are you in the room? Please stand up and let's give you an even bigger round of applause. Congratulations. And uh, Andy has asked me to remind you all that you can hear those five winners on Radio 4. That's going to be in the last week of July. So from the 25th to the 29th of July, they'll get their linear TX. Um, as part of the uh, new Storytellers collection as well, um, you can hear all the previous winners there. So all the previous, I think there are 15 there. So if you just search for new Storytellers in BBC Sounds, um, you can listen to them all. So what a fantastic way to bring... Charles Parker Day to a close. Um, I'd like to thank all of today's speakers for your time and sharing your incredible audio with us and your insights. Thank you to Pete. Let's have a big hand for Pete. Hugh Ramlin's on tech today. <laughs> and Dan. Dan. And Dan. Sorry, Dan. Dan, let's hear it for Dan. <laughs> And um, to everyone here at Birmingham City University, to the fantastic Andy Cartwright for his unending energy. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> and uh, special thanks as well to everyone for watching us online this year. So we hope Charles Parker Day next year will be all together in one space. Um, exact date and location to be confirmed. Um, but until then, uh, thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>